Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction, Canada's Sportsbook. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Big Money Siege. We start off today's podcast with some style. I know you know all about style. Look at the suits you wear sometimes. This is our opportunity, our first crack at you telling us how you feel about those reverse retro jerseys. How you feel about them? They were ridiculous, man. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got some new merch this week. Shout out the That's Ridiculous line. Uh, make sure to hit up the SDPN website uh, to check out the store for merch. You can find a bunch of ridiculous clothes there, including stuff that has Ridic on it. I have to say on the jerseys, I kind of, I like the, how do I put this? I sort of like that there's some ability to maybe try some things. Obviously they don't all hit the way maybe they were intended. Um, But I I think the more creative outside the box stuff out there, the better, you know, I I actually, there's, there's quite a number of these ones I liked and they, they tend to be the teams maybe that have, maybe not as deep of histories. And so maybe they can, they can do some different things, you know, like I sort of feel to some degree, if it's the Canadians or the Leafs or the original six teams, Detroit, Chicago, we saw like, like I feel like they they can't take as many creative licenses with their, their looks be just because they're they're so established in terms of marks. Whereas I, you know, I think some of the newer entrants in the league and new here as teams that are like 30 years old or less, uh, I, for me, they they have some of the most interesting designs. And so I, I like that the league does this. I want to see more of it. You know, I don't think there's any problem if, like, I know there's a rule, but how many different sweaters in a season a team can wear. But if we had six or seven in a year for a team, it wouldn't bother me, quite honestly. I think it's interesting and, and obviously gives gives something for fans and marketing and all that. So I say let's open the floodgates and have the more weird. Let's get weird here with the, you know the NHL sweater game. I'd be down with that. Uh, do you have a top three or a top five, maybe top three or whichever one you like of uh, the best reverse retro jerseys of this year? Yeah, I, I really like the Sharks channeling the California Golden Seals. I think some of this, like the, the whole concept right, of reverse retro, it might some of this might be age dependent almost like mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's probably young fans out there. And I don't say this in a demeaning way that aren't even aware that there was ever a team called the California Golden Seals. Um, you know, that team was actually before my time. I never saw them play or anything, but I'm aware kind of of the history there. And so I thought it was cool that they they sort of tapped into that with theirs and did something a little bit different. Um, I think I had L.A. second and, you know, they went back. They, they did another riff on sort of their purple and, and form. Was it form gold or form purple? Uh, anyway, they used to play in the Great Western form, but their old purple and yellow look, which, you know, is very much of its era. And and a little bit garish, uh, but I just I think it's kind of cool. And I actually liked what the Panthers did. I thought the Panthers, um, you know, they they channeled sort of the Southern Florida feel with with using the colors as they did. Um, you know, I also liked what Arizona did. Again, it's it's some people might think that thing is just pure ugly, but um, you know, seeing them have all the colors they splash in there, I thought you know it's it sort of to me that's. That's what's interesting. And, and as I acknowledge off the top, look, some teams just can't do that. Or, uh, like, I don't think that, you know, people be like rolling over in graves or something if a hundred year old team is, is getting that crazy with their jerseys. But I, I like that some of the newer teams in the league were able to, to take some, some liberties and, and try some new things. Tell you what, uh, when you mentioned the fact that some teams can't take certain liberties, like I thought of the Canadians and the fact that they tried to incorporate Expos colors, I was like, okay, that's, that's okay. But like the more I look at it, I'm like, you know what? They at least tried something. Um, what did you think of? Uh, there's some other jerseys I was like eh, on. Like, I, I I didn't really like the Calgary Flames one. I thought like I think a lot of people wanted the pedestal at the bottom. I was like, it's okay. And I think a lot of the excitement on jerseys went for Blasty anyway. The Ducks one was kind of okay. They got the logo back. It's just the colors. I mean, I would have liked the OG colors. What do you think of okay. Tampa? The Tampa one was pretty wild. You know what? Temp- Tampa starting to Tampa starting to grow on me a little bit. I wasn't sure about it at first, but like I I kind of I I dig it a little bit more. It's just a little wild. Like just 
like the the random flames on the side. I'm like, what what are we doing here? This is a bit excessive, but I don't know. It's growing on me a little bit. Well, a granted, look, bit. these teams are going to wear, I think, the jerseys, you know, between like three and five games. Like, it's not this is this is not becoming regular looks. No one's going to be in a Stanley Cup final playing in one of these sweaters. Like, this is purely marketing and to get us talking too. Uh, what do you think about my ranking? Were you okay with it? Did you? Did I you- actually, th- you know what? Actually, like, so the Sharks one, I wasn't crazy on. I'm trying to think. You know what? Like, my pick for number one is very different, and. The reason why my pick for number one is what it is is because I really wanted them to do this the last time, but they ended up not doing anything. Hmm. I think the Islanders have the best one. The Islanders went to Larry, went to the fishermen, and they did the damn job. It looks really good. The Capitals also should be in that top three as well. Going back to that OG jersey with the bird, like that's a good one. The Sharks one's pretty good. The Kings one, they were really good the last time. I like how high you put them up as well. Um, the Panthers. I don't know how I feel about the Panthers. I get it. They got the colors. It's supposed to be South Florida, but like, I don't like them going away from the Panther cat. Like the Panther cat is really cool, but like, it's not as crazy for me. The Coyotes one is okay. It's just okay. There's a lot of jerseys that are just okay. And I don't think this year's batch is nearly as good as uh, the previous batch of reverse retro jerseys, but there are some really good ones. The Canucks one's really good. I love the Johnny Canuck one. It's actually funny because when I first saw just like the lineup of the, the sweaters, I was like, what is that? Like, what yeah. team is that? <laughs> like, I had to really think about it for a moment to realize it was Vancouver's jersey. So, um, but this is, this is again, the whole point of the exercise. Like, I think it's fun. I think it's cool. Uh, I hope we get more of it. I'm even for, like, maybe I'm getting a little crazy here, but I'm even for some of the old, like the older teams trying something totally new, like moving away from their traditional logos for one or what have you, like the Bruins did, right? Like the Bruins brought back the bear. I like the Bruins one. And not everybody likes that. But like, my point is they didn't just stick with the spoke B that we're so used to seeing. I, it wouldn't bother me if the, the Canadians or the Leafs or one of those teams got away from their logo entirely just for one of these sweaters. I think, I think it would be kind of cool. I'm sure there's people that work for those teams that are saying I'm crazy, but to me, this is just, Look, it's it's a marketing exercise. It's to try to connect the young fans. And uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a little bit bold. No. Um, I have to mention this. Chicago and Detroit have the same jersey. <laughs> <laughs> they have the same jersey. <laughs> like, at first when I saw Chicago's, I was like, okay, maybe they're trying to find a way to move away from the logo or that's just a way for them to do it. And then I saw Detroit, so I'm like, it's it's the same thing. It's like that scene in the office where Jay, uh, not Jay, uh, uh, Pam is supposed to look at these photos. Fo- look at these photos. Like you're supposed to figure out the difference. It's just like it's the same photo. That's basically what it is, right? Or like, is this dress blue or gold? Yeah, it, <laughs> everybody stare at these that. photos and tell me the difference. It's not that different. Um, they, do you, you have know, any opinions? Detroit Go ahead. had a tough one last time too. Remember Detroit had sort yeah. of like the one that looked like a practice jersey. So. Yeah, the one that looked like one of those like uh, plain, like uh, co- yeah, the plain Coca Cola can looking jerseys. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. who knows? Like, I actually don't know the process, but I should know this probably. I don't know how this gets done. I mean, obviously you're working with the sweater manufacturer, but I don't know if it's it's. I'm assuming it's a collaborative effort between the teams and and the the sweater maker, but I don't, I don't know how I don't know how these come into being. Um, I know. With my exchange with the Calgary Flames director of marketing, uh, I believe his name is Ryan Povovich. Uh, we had a, just a little like back and forth on Twitter. I think he had mentioned that at least in Calgary, like the fans, if they weren't going to get blasty, they wanted the pedestal. And I think it's just like it's the three stripes at the bottom of their jersey. And I think that played into some of it. Uh, I'm going to take the time to plug uh, an article on the athletic from Haley Salvian and Sean Gentilly, where they actually have. A, uh, a Q&A with Dan Neer, who is the Adidas global head of hockey, about uh, the process of creating jerseys. And I think they had them on uh, the Athletic Hockey Show. Um, but uh, yeah, check those out if you want to know more about how that is produced, uh, especially for those who happen to be listening to the show on the Athletic app. Uh, one last thing, the Leafs jersey. Did you have any thoughts on the Leafs jersey? I actually thought it was okay. Um, but it's it, but it's it's quite plain in a sense, right? Like there's nothing 
too bold being done there, but I have no, I take no issue with it. It's, it's like one of those ones I'm, I'm almost ambivalent. Like I, I, I'm not like, that's cool, but, I, but I also, I have nothing to really say negatively about it. It looks, it looks like a mock-up of a couple different jerseys they wore when I was a kid. So like, I guess they're, they're playing into the, the retro theme, but it's, you know, there's nothing. I, I didn't like the the previous one. Remember they had one that I, I'm getting mixed up because I can't remember if it was for an outdoor game or the reverse retro, but they had one that was like gray and blue. Yeah, I think that was a reverse retro one. I didn't like that one as much. This and one's that better. One, yeah, this is definitely better than that. Um, but as I say, I it, it wasn't threatening to be in my top three. Yeah, it, it my thing with it, and we don't have to belabor the point that much, uh, but like it just, see, at least the Panthers, they tried. There are other teams that tried to do something different. I don't feel the Leafs tried anything crazy with their jersey, or at least tried anything to go a little bit different. It's objectively a nice looking jersey. It's just not. Like you could have told me that's the jersey they play with every night, and I wouldn't have really noticed that much of a difference. Fair. I mean, I think that they take their logo very seriously, right? It's it's much like the Canadian C. Sure. And and I think that they they have trouble imagining just scrapping the logo and doing something wild and different. I I have again, I didn't ask anyone there about that, but you know, I know how seriously they take their history and and take pride in being a team that's a hundred plus years old. You know, they've tried to do, you know, they, they've switched the jerseys, the regular jerseys a little bit and tried to, you know, give a throwback to actually the Maple Leaf that's on the normal crest now is, is I think, the same one that was worn in 1967. So, mm. you know, they've, I, I just think that they're probably a little bit hamstrung by the fact that they 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 really like their mark and they don't, they don't want to change it that much. They're probably not one of the teams that's like itching to come up with new designs. Whereas I do think if you're a team with less of a history, you're not weighed down by that history. And you can, you know, like Vegas, like Vegas can do anything now. Um, they I like wear, their jersey. They can wear purple helmets or neon green helmets or whatever. And we all go, yeah, it's Vegas. It's crazy. It's, you know, like, so it's like, they, they, right. Well, they, they, but they have, they have like this huge creative free will and, and they've, to their credit, they've used it a little bit with the gold helmets and everything they've done over the years. Absolutely. That's going to do it for uh, CJ and Julian style takes on the, the Chris Johnston show. Time to bring on David Bastel from Sports Interaction. As always, for people 19 and over, we ask that you play responsibly. And there is a link to responsible gaming strategies in the description of this show. It's time for You Can Bet That. Welcome to You Can Bet That with David Bastel. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. Pittsburgh and Edmonton is where we're going to start. Obviously, people are going to want to look at the Sidney Crosby versus Connor McDavid matchup. Anytime those two get together, it is sure to be a good time. The money line for Pittsburgh, 2.01, Edmonton, 1.83. Tell us more about this matchup, DB. Yeah, and you're bang on when you say the superstar matchup, right? Uh, the other thing, too, is Pittsburgh's gone off to a pretty good start. 4-0-1 through the first five games. That's not bad. Oilers, a little bit of a struggle as of late, CJ. Losers of three of their last four, but they are favorites tonight against the Penguins. Just wondering, you think they can get this done? For sure. I mean, the one thing I wonder about Edmonton, they've had a long run of home games. I know that that, that tends to go in their favor, but, you know, sometimes too much time in one place can can sort of lead to stale feel around a team. Oh, the other thing that, that makes this so cool is Crosby and McDavid. It's brand new early in the season, but they're right at the top of the scoring list. You know, two guys that have both had individually hot starts too. So I think this will be a pretty compelling game. And uh, I'm sure you can find some good prop bets around those two players too. I'm pretty sure. Let's look at the Leafs and the Golden Knights. Money line for Toronto at 1.81, uh, Vegas at 2.02. Uh, Phil Kessel, by the way, and we'll get to this uh, later on in our show, uh, about to tie the record for consecutive games played uh, by an NHL player against his former team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, it's crazy. I, it's uh, it's funny, though, because here in Toronto, you, you always get the old Kessel's playing the Leafs again, and there's a lot of people that miss Phil. You know, Phil's almost turned into the this cult following a little bit and i think people start liking him even more and more and more and and so forth that's kind of cool leaves uh slight favorites in vegas and and cj over the last couple of years road teams favored in vegas that does not happen very often but of course this is a different vegas team than we've seen for the last couple of years right and the leafs have steadied the ship a little bit uh it's funny we, we go day by day with this team whether everyone's panicking <laughs> or everything's fine uh, but, you know, Sam Sonoff, the, the goaltenders had a perfect start to, to his season in Toronto with four wins. And, uh, you know, I think things have calmed down a little bit around them. But, you know, it's the start of a long trip for the Leafs. They were 
flew in there late Saturday night, had a practice there Sunday. We'll see if they have their, their skating legs uh, on Monday night. And if you uh, somehow don't want to watch the NHL tonight, uh, there is an enthralling, amazing, oh, yes, gripping Monday night football game between the Chicago <laughs> Bears and the New England Patriots. So the point spread at nine and a half. And I believe New England is favored in that game, DB. Yeah, I expected to start Mac Jones returning from injury. So that number kind of bumped up yesterday. If you bought this number is around eight. Some books were providing seven and a half. So we hear the news about Mac Jones. So there is a little bit of a tilt in New England's favorite. Now they're favored by even more. And for my money, CJ, this should not be on Monday night. This is more of a Thursday night game because Thursday night games have been dreadful in the NFL this year. Yeah, it does definitely have that Thursday flavor to it. Uh, you know, the Patriots aren't what they once were. The Bears, I don't know. They've been adrift for all these years. But um, I've got some fantasy action, so I'll be watching. There you go. <laughs> there we go. There's at least some use for somebody. On that Monday night football matchup. DB, thanks so much for hanging out with us on You Can Bet That. Don't forget to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Again, sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. Peace. Take care. The Vancouver Canucks. We have to start there. Things are not all well. Things are not well in Vancouver. The sky is actually falling over there. It is not good. Uh, They have not won a game in their first six. We see players arguing on the ice with each other. Uh, That JT Miller contract, a lot of people are feeling some buyer's remorse on that already. Uh, uh, Jim Rutherford doesn't seem to be all that happy with the way his team is going. It's it's, jerseys being tossed to the ice. Seriously, it's, it's madness. It's awful in Vancouver. Siege, what's your read on whatever the hell is going on? in vancouver if ever a team needed a win they need a win and they they play Mm -hmm. monday night so you might actually be listening to this podcast and and you will know if they had a win or not against the carolina hurricanes we don't know that as we're recording right now but they just need to to get something going in the right direction to calm everything down and i actually you know I know in our early, like the first week or two of the season, I'm always like, let's be calm. You know, let's not overreact to things. You know, people are freaking out in Toronto and all of a sudden Leafs are four and two and it's, it doesn't seem quite so bad, right? Like, but I, I do think in Vancouver, it's, it's some of this is justified. I mean, they, they were a team in my eyes that were going to be touch and go to make the playoffs as it was, you know, to, to only come away from your first six games with two, you know, overtime loser points to have blown the leads they've blown. You know, they now have to play at something like a hundred point pace to get to whatever, 95 points or whatever that is. Um, you know, they're 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 digging a legitimate hole. And even though you one hand is like oh, it's six games and there's 76 left, well, uh, it gets late early if, if you if you really look at, at what they need to now do to to try to be in that playoff race where I think that they expect to be. So um, you know, it's it's the losing and then it's it's kind of everything else going on. I mean. I credit Jim Rutherford for going on after hours on Saturday after that loss to, to Buffalo, you know, a really tough loss. You know, you'd just seen, you know, a few sweaters thrown over the glass by your fans. And, and, you know, he gave a really honest interview with Scott Oak and John Garrett, but man, um, you know, he, I have a lot of time for Jim Rutherford. He, he didn't, he didn't sugarcoat the situation, right? He, like he oh, actually God. said the words, we might be headed for a rebuild the direction we're going, right? He, he said, we have a lot of bad habits. Like he said, we had a bad training camp and we've got a lot of bad habits in our game. Like, I don't know that I've ever heard an executive say that like two weeks into the season. Uh, I mean, a pretty scathing indictment of, I would think the coaching staff, which is responsible for running training camp. Um, and, you know, obviously the the players that are meant to not have those bad habits. And, and so I don't know where they go from here, quite honestly, like, the most obvious thing that we can talk about is do you fire Bruce Boudreaux? You know, he's only under contract for the rest of this year. You've already used the same bullet on Travis Green last December. So it's not even a year later. And you've like, like, is that really going to give you the response you're looking for? Or are you just, you know, throwing bodies overboard to do something? I mean, maybe that's what will happen. But, you know, let's let's keep in mind, too. I believe Travis Green's still being paid. Bruce Boudreaux would be paid out for the year. So you'd be looking at paying a third head coach at the same time, you know, that's a tough move to make. I don't think we can realistically come up with a trade two weeks into the season. That's going to magically turn this around. I mean, at the end of the day, the Canucks have good players, um, but they're they're not getting a whole lot done on the ice. I mean, the Pedersen line has been pretty good. 
Uh, but beyond that, it's it's been tough to watch, and they can't hold a lead. And my goodness, I, I'm 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 usually like a glass half full kind of person, and and I, I'm having trouble seeing where where the glass is half full here. You know, other than the fact they do have some good players. I mean, sometimes we're talking about teams that are struggling. It's just like they can't compete. Well, I, I do think the Canucks can compete. Uh, you know, would help if they got healthier and Quinn Hughes was back um, because he's been out injured now, but it's a, it's a tough situation and the games just keep coming, right? Like, like the schedule is relentless, but you're almost probably looking for a life preserver if you're in that situation, because everybody's rightly sort of freaking out and a lot of tough talk around the team, the fans are booing, and then you got to play a game 48 hours later. And as I say, they just, they need a win to sort of calm things down to like find their footing and and I think almost have a reset. And if if they keep losing, I mean, what we saw Saturday will just be the tip of the iceberg. One comment I see going around on Canucks Twitter a lot. It's a, a just an excerpt from uh, a media veil that Bo Horvat had over the weekend. Uh, it's been a lot of years in the rebuild stage, and I know there's an ellipsis here, but after that, he says, at this point in the season, it just feels like it's never going to happen. Like we're never going to win again. Like you talk about the honesty from Jim Rutherford. It's at the point where, like, guys like Bo Horvat, Bo, Bo Horvat, the captain of the team, is like feeling so down on himself. Like, that's just, I just think it's really brutal what's going on in Vancouver. Well, look, it's tough. A Canadian market can be tough at the best of times, right? There's not a lot of patience that that tends to be on offer to to teams that play in markets where they're they're like the main fundamental team going on in, in their marketplace, where they're discussed by everyone on podcasts, talk radio, newspapers. The athletic, like teams that are covered, teams that are covered a lot, it tends to be a lot of different voices that when things go wrong, right? And and so there, that's what Vancouver has to deal with on a day to day basis. And then you you couple the fact that this has really been a disastrous start to the year, that that produces the conditions where you have what you have today. And you know, I've actually been around. If you go back to some of those Leafs teams, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, and and I was you know covering those teams, and they had some stretches like this, and what I found from that experience is that people get really honest. Like you can kind of lie to yourself when you're just going along 50, 50, winning a game, losing a game. Like, you know, there might be some calmness or, or voices in the market that are saying this team should be better. or It isn't good enough, but like, it doesn't get to this level. Right. But this is like, you know, this is like you've, the emperor has no clothes right now. I mean, you can't, you almost have to call it like it is right. There's, it's hard. It would be hard to sugarcoat it. I mean, I guess you could point out that they've had leads in those first four games, uh, multi-goal leads that went away. You know, it's not like they're losing 5-1 every night the way they did on Saturday. Um, but I think the problem is you're not seeing a response. The team isn't getting better. There's not. There hasn't been a pushback in the face of those disappointments early on in the year. And look, the schedule didn't help Vancouver either. Like starting with a five-game road trip when things don't start well, that's that's tough. And no one wants to hear that excuse, but it, you know, that is a factor I'm sure in what's happened. You know, the fact they've had some injuries on their blue line has been a factor. I mean, all that stuff gets thrown out of play at a certain point. Cause you just have to find a way to win and, and teams everywhere scrap together seasons, right? Like the, no one's feeling bad for the Boston Bruins starting this year without a couple of their best players. And, you know, they've, they've found a way to win games, you know, without having what we, we would consider their optimal lineup. I mean, it's, they're top of the Atlantic right now. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's a, it's a reality and a team like Boston has done it for a long time, right? That, that organization has been in, in the top handful of teams for, for 10 years, more or less. I mean, I know they missed the playoffs for a brief stretch. And then do you know what they did when they missed the playoffs those years, they drafted Charlie McAvoy and David Pasternak and, and oh, lo and behold, everything got back on track pretty quickly. So, um, you know, Vancouver, it's, it's going to be a process there. Like, I don't know what they do big picture. I mean, I know that the discussions about the rebuild, right. And, and, mm -hmm. Can you go down that road? I mean, the time to do it was many years ago. I guess it's like that saying that I like to try to, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. I mean, maybe maybe you get to that point where you just like, we should have already done this. Um, maybe we have to do it. You know, clearly the plan when Jim Rutherford was hired as the president last December was to maybe retool on the fly, to, but but to keep guys like Quinn Hughes and Elias Pettersson and Thatcher Demko, obviously JT Miller, you know, getting his long-term extension, you, you sort of have what you feel is a core and, and you hope to build around it, but they're saddled with a lot of big contracts for guys that just can't contribute at the level you need from the previous administration. I mean, that's, that's not on the current front office because it literally has all been turned on, turned over since then. Um, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't know what happens next or how bad they can let this get. Uh, but, I, but I will tell you this, I'll be watching Monday night's game because it's uh, pretty, pretty gripping when, when you see a team already in this degree of, you know, chaos, frankly, two weeks into the season. Tell you what, they lose to Carolina. That's one thing. They lose to Seattle later this week. Oh, that is not going to go well at all. Nope. Mm -mm -mm. Not well, good for the Vancouver Right Canucks. now, I mean, like, like I don't know. This is this is the hard thing, and I know we talked with the Canucks a lot in our season one of our pod because they were, you know, making headlines for some of the same reasons last year at the start of the year. It's like you look at the team and there's still there's so many good individual players or top end individual players like most. There's, some, there's a lot of franchises in this league that would like kill to have their best forward, their best D. You know what I mean? Like, like they they have, but it's it's not enough around those guys. And clearly, I don't even know if we can call this coaching, honestly. And it's not to defend Bruce Boudreaux, but it's just the same thing happened last year to Travis Green. Um, you know, it's there, there's something going on there, and, and I I suspect they're going to have to go on a bigger. I think they're going to have to make bigger changes ultimately. I just, I don't know that you can make those changes today because there's still games to play and you're not, you're not trading away fundamental parts of your team in October, just because you lose six games in a row. Yeah. Like if you're a Canucks fan, like who are you mad at? Like you did all this last year and and the admin gone and, 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 and new people come in and, and all that. Like, is it the players? Like I, I feel like that's how I would feel if I was a Canucks fan. Like I don't know who to be mad at at this point because I got mad last year. I threw my jersey on the ice. Not saying I actually did. Just me being hey, just yeah. speaking figuratively. But like I don't like I'd be so frustrated. And you're absolutely right on the rebuild thing. Like they might have to go there, but maybe they go on a like five game stretch where they play really well, and maybe things change for the better. But maybe that's me being like way too optimistic about this Canucks core, which is. It has so many good players. That's what makes this so frustrating. Pedersen, Hughes, Thatcher Demko is a good goalie. Like they have good players. It's I so sense, frustrating. I mean, obviously, different fans. Like, there's no one opinion, but I, I sense a lot of fans are mad at the organization for not doing a rebuild sooner. Essentially, for like refusing to ever strip it down to the parts. Because I think what they're saying is, all these years you refuse to do that. Well, we the team hasn't really gotten any better. I mean, I know they had a nice run in the bubble. Thing look, things looked up, you know, in Edmonton for them uh, in that 2020 season that was paused by the coronavirus. But, you know, in general, they have not trended in the right direction. And you're now even years down the line, you're like, are we any farther along than we would have been? Um, you know, I don't have a strong opinion on that rebuild question, but but I, I noticed in that after hours program, a couple variations of the, the viewer questions they took for Jim Rutherford were sort of about a rebuild or thinking bigger term that that's what prompted him to, to deliver the line. He did. I, I've just seen that discussion on in Canucks Twitter, just, you know, basically after the Sedins, there hasn't been much hope and, you know, maybe this is, you know, rebuilding slash tanking is it's a, it's a hard question because the way the league has changed the, the draft lottery rules is you need a lot of luck still like, and it's not fun to finish 32nd in a 32 team league. Like that's a lot of games that you're losing and and you obviously give away like you become less relevant in your market during that time your fans tune you out probably harder to sell tickets and jerseys and 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 then at the end of it you might end up with the fourth pick or the third pick and and sometimes the third pick doesn't really do much for your program quite frankly and so i think it's it's a difficult thing to do to, to just abjectly tank you know, it's funny, we should probably talk about the Buffalo Sabres at some point. The Sabres finally do seem to have, have taken a step forward as an organization, but the reason they're good right now isn't because they tanked in 2014 and 15, right? Like that, they don't have all that much to show for it. I guess if you want to do like third string effects that, well, they got Jack Eichel, and then that didn't work. And then that, that you know, got the trade for Alex Tuck and Peyton Krebs. Like maybe you, you want to connect that directly to the tank here, but pretty clearly the Sabres didn't benefit from abjectly tanking I, I like i think at this point we're looking at like multi-generations down the road from those teams uh and basically the players they got in those tanks aren't, aren't a factor anymore they've had to switch coaches a couple times like it's it's been a long road back to respectability for buffalo i think it's great that in my eyes they're there i mean to see them go through western canada and sweep those games that's you know that's that's the other side of this coin uh here is that you know, on one hand, you're seeing a team that the Canucks might not be as good as we thought they could be. Well, Buffalo is probably a little better than most people thought they were going to be, at least at least based on the start they've had. And, and 
you know, there's hope in that in general, right? Your, your team can turn a corner one day, and maybe that's what we're seeing with the Sabres. The Sabres, at least off the one game I saw them play against Calgary, they look good. I don't know if they can keep that up to make the playoffs, but at least off of what I saw, they can skate. They have skill. They're, re- I think they're really fun to watch. And you talk about the Sabres and their rebuilding efforts. Like they're, they're on, they're rebuilding their rebuilding efforts to be quite frank, but it looks like it's I actually think working. rebuilding the rebuild of the rebuild. Yeah. Like it's like, that's a team that I think for like, oh, like over a decade ago, they were, they were, I don't know if it's you could say it's the same situation as what the Canucks were in, but like you could look at the pieces that they had and you could say, man, they really need to close up shop. But it took them a long time to get to this point now. But they look like they have a good coach in Don Granado and, and Rasmus uh, Dahlin, who I wanted to just mention a little bit. He's he's playing like the world's best defenseman right now. He's like an early front runner for the Norris Trophy. And he has the the five good game goal streak, which is like the longest to start a season by any NHL defenseman. He looks really good out there. Like, and this like the Sabres should be happy. Like, you should, you should, if you're a Sabres fan, you should feel some sort of relief. They finally look competent. Well, and the cool thing about Darlene is two twofold. I mean, he was a former number one overall pick that took some time to to sort of show the promise that got him drafted at the top of the draft. But you know, this is also an extension of last season for me. Like he he was excellent last year particularly in the back half of the season their team started winning more games at that point in time probably somewhat related that the guy that spends the most time on the ice uh, is, is making a, a positive impact your, your team's going to have more chance at success and then the fact he started this season in that manner I mean I think you start to go like okay yeah he's figured it out like he's he he, he got there and you know I think coach the coaching staff deserves a lot of credit for that because you know he he played what three and a half years in the league before he made any sort of meaningful impact and and you know i don't put that all on his shoulders i mean he was brought into these teams where things weren't working and you know i i think it's about opportunity for players but sometimes it's about having the proper support around them and you know rasmus dalin you know could be part of the engine that 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 drives this group forward and and they have a lot of other appealing young players you know playing with them so you know i I think that that they are they are a good news story i don't i don't know about the goaltending still um, you know, credit where it's due. Eric Comrie is is being asked essentially to to fill a role he's never filled. He had a great year in Winnipeg last year uh, as their backup, but but you know was playing behind Connor Hellebuck. Didn't have to log the meaningful minutes, and you know now you see can he do it over more games? You know he's he's it would appear to me going to get his chance. They have Craig Anderson there, you know a story of resilience that that he's still in the league. I believe he might be the oldest player in the league last I checked this season. So yeah, I, I don't know if it can hold up either, but. They play a pretty complete game, does Buffalo. And, you know, as, as much as I'm talking about it, it being tough for Vancouver to have that, that road trip out of the gates and, and didn't help their cause, well, you know, this could have been a tough start for the Sabres going through Western Canada, and, and they found a way to beat all three uh, Western Canadian teams. And, and now you're like, okay, they, they got some traction. Let's see let's see how they can do next. One thing we need to just mention with Rasmus Dahlin, Rasmus Dahlin is 22 years old. I don't know if people think about that enough but like Ross was was playing world junior games as a 16 year old with team Sweden in Montreal in 2017 I remember watching at least one of those games like in person like seeing like wow like Ross was is a 16 year old playing with 18 year olds at a world junior tournament and he's doing this like he, he's in his fifth year with the Sabres and he's 22 years old as a defenseman it already takes them so long to develop into you know true number one defense or just quality players at the back end like this is quite a journey for for Rasmus Dahlin, uh, with the talent that he has. It's one thing to be put onto teams where you know they're not saying all that much, but it's a whole other thing for him at the age that he's at to be on those teams, and for him to now get to at least for his start, it looks really good. And and you mentioned a continuation from last year. Like it's taken a lot for him to get to this point. The fact that he's only twenty two, like this is really impressive. Well, how about this comparable? You know, Victor Hedman was drafted at the top of a draft many years ago and, and took him a few years. And I'm pretty sure almost every player in the league would gladly trade their career for Victor Hedman's in terms of active players, pretty much. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that he's going to go on and win multiple Norris trophies or be nominated every year the way Hedman has for the, this last number. But, um, you know, I, I think it's certainly possible. I think it's it's a good thing to keep in mind that, it, not every defenseman steps in and does what Kale McCarr is doing. Now, now he had an extra year of development before joining uh, the Avalanche. You know, stayed back in college for an extra season 
uh, after his draft year. But, you know, it, it's maybe one more feather in McCarr's cap that, that, that he was able to step in the league and be a point per game player over his first whatever 150 games or whatever he's at now. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is for most guys, it, it takes a couple of years. And, you know, Dalene, he's so young. I mean, like he, he might dominate the next 10 years in this league. I mean, I, I it, you certainly can't rule out that possibility. And, and if that's the case, I mean, my goodness, it's that the Atlantic division is going to get even stronger, even quicker than, than some of us thought. Yeah. The only thing is at 22 now, uh, Ross was Darlene might age himself for team North America at the world cup uh, of 2024. If they ever had. Oh, right. Yes. That, but he's also like under 23 now, but yeah, but he, he wouldn't have been it. eligible for team North America. Is that team right? Because it's under. I thought it was under twenty three. I love that you're just trying so hard to manifest. That's true. Fine. You don't even care where. Fine. You don't even care where the players are from. It doesn't matter. I really wanted to do it. You're right. It was for North American players. That's right. He's not North American. Just want a young guns team. Period. I really want a good young guns team. It doesn't even matter. I completely disregard the fact that he's not even North American. It doesn't matter. I really want it anyway. um, (laughs) Phil Kessel uh, playing his record tying nine hundred and eighty ninth consecutive game. Tonight, Monday, against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, do you have any thoughts about Phil Castle? What was it like covering him? I've got a lot of thoughts, but how about this one? What were you doing on October 31st, 2009? So Halloween Ooh. night. I don't know what year you would have been, how old you would have been. Ooh, I would have been 50. This, that's ninth grade for me. So you so probably 50. weren't trick-or-treating at that age. I, I would have that would have been like one of the first few years like I would just stopped trick-or-treating altogether I stopped after seventh grade I might have been at a Halloween party I might have been just home I don't know actually well that was the last time Phil Kessel missed an NHL game wow so Jeez. there's some perspective for you man um that, that he has played every single game between now and then you know almost 13 straight years of games uh it's it's hard to comprehend really for any player, honestly, like it, it's, I mean, we can get into all this stuff and get into the fact he, he hasn't looked like a top level athlete, but every single player that he played with talks about how strong he is, how almost freakish he is in, in the way he can um, do things in the weight room. We could, we could talk about some of his media persona, which I think was largely probably blown out of proportion because he was the biggest star on Maple Leaf teams that were covered by a lot of people like myself, but, but was a little bit reluctant about that part of his job. We can talk about the fact this man filled the Stanley Cup with hot dogs. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what I he's such an interesting so guy. He's such an interesting guy to me. Like he, he, he. It's it's so fascinating that he will become the NHL Iron Man almost for certain. He's he's at minimum going to match Keith Yandel when he when he plays Monday night for the Vegas Golden Knights and and has a chance Tuesday to become the solo leader. You know, he's only a couple weeks more worth of games of playing a thousand straight games in the NHL. Um, but the fact he did it while being all of those things, I think makes it even more interesting for me, um, because he's not a workout freak, right? He, he hasn't been, you know, John Mattis and, and I can't remember who co-wrote the article with him at the score, did a nice job talking to all sorts of people that played with Kessel over the years. And, and I really enjoyed that read last week. And like so many teammates talk about the fact, like, it's not like he's the guy coming in, he's on a juice diet or he's, you know, going gluten-free this season or whatever. He's like, he, he, he just is, he was like unapologetically himself uh, his whole career. And so I, I think it's kind of cool that he'll be the one to set that mark. Um, yeah. I had lots of interactions with him back in the day. Like when he was playing for the Leafs, he was, he, he really didn't like the scrums. He, he actually could be okay. If you got him sort of in a one-on-one or one-on-two type of situation where it's a little bit more like a conversation no, we used to kind of have a, a bit of an unspoken deal that if I needed him, I, I sort of wait and walk to the bus with him because then, you know, all the cameras wouldn't get around him and he could, you know, give his thoughts. But even that sometimes went sideways. Other times I'd stop him in the hallway and he'd get mad that I stopped him in the hallway. Oh, my uh, God. But, I mean, all that's water under the bridge. There's no, I don't have any bad takeaways from that. He just, he was, he was one of the more challenging players to cover, though, I will say, um, because, you know, you know, Julian now being around a team and, and your time in Montreal, like he could score two goals in a game and, and refuse to speak to the media, uh, which, you know, the older I am now and I look back and I'm like, look, at, if he doesn't want to do it, he really shouldn't have to do it. I know it's sort of everyone's job, but come on, like, is it does it really matter? Probably not. But like at that time, 
you wanted to hear from him, right? He was the most important player on the team or one of the most important players. And, and you could never get that much out of him. I will say it was really cool after he got traded to Pittsburgh. I covered both of those Penguins Cups in 2016 and 17. I remember just how happy he was to be on a winning team. And I think it might have been when the Penguins won. We, we had a funny moment. I think it might have been when the Penguins advanced the Stanley Cup final in 2016. So he was going to his first Stanley Cup final. And I walked in the dressing room and he looked. He was like, holy fuck, eh? Like, like he was just like... Because kind of like, you know, he he knew that I'd sort of seen the things he went through in Toronto. Those teams he was on were largely not very good. They had all the stuff from the salute gate thing to ego waffles being thrown on the ice. I mean, it was just kind of a not a great time in it around the Leafs franchise. And, you know, he he got a chance to show, I think, a different side of himself when he went to Pittsburgh. So, you know, he's a most interesting athlete. Maybe I've I've been around in, in, in some ways just because he's so different. He challenges kind of your, your the stereotypes or he challenges whatever conceptions you have of what a high level player should be. But, you know, I, I don't think any of us should lose sight of the fact October 31st, 2009 is the last time he missed a game. He had a shoulder surgery before starting his career with the Leafs and he's played everyone since. I don't know how long this will go on for, but, you know, to get to a thousand games, I think it's a huge mark. I mean, players want to have thousand games careers. No one thinks about playing a thousand games in a row, but Phil might just do it. I think November 17th, if all goes well, will be the date of when Phil Kessel will play game number 1000 against the Arizona Coyotes. Let's also not forget that in one of the games leading up to this point that he's at right now, he played a shift before going to the hospital to tend to his pregnant wife. Let's never forget that. Like he went to the hospital. Well, what do you think of that? Like some people didn't like that. I thought that was pretty cool. Like I, 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 it counts. It counts, right? It does. Nothing wrong with me. Yeah, what I heard nothing wrong with that. Hand, I heard he actually wanted to play that whole game, but someone sort of got in the middle of that plan. Like, I, like that he wasn't his only intention to play one shift and then fly back. You know, I don't know if it adds an asterisk or whatever. I, mean, I have a guess as, as to who could get in the middle of that. Maybe his wife. <laughs> right. Or saw with the organization. I don't know. Maybe talk some sense into him. Um, but yeah, what was crazy is that game was played in Detroit. This is when he played for the Arizona Coyotes. He flew back on a private jet to Arizona for the birth of his child and then was in Toronto a day or two later for the next game on the road trip. So it wasn't it wasn't a convenient uh, situation either. It involved quite a bit of travel. Um, yeah, some people didn't like that he did that to keep the streak going. But I don't know. Wasn't like Cal Ripken Jr. was was set the baseball streak. And I'm pretty sure there were games he played an inning or two and then was was removed from the game. I mean we're getting into some, it's not like he's done this all throughout, right. To keep it going. It's one very specific circumstance. And I think the birth of a child is pretty important for, for obvious reasons. hundred percent. Now our next partner is a pretty cool product. Let's talk about athletic greens. If you're looking to get better gut health, more energy, or a stronger immune system in a really easy, natural way, you've got to check out athletic greens. I'm sure you'll agree that most of us are not huge fans of having to take a bunch of pills or vitamins in the morning, but with Athletic Greens, you can get rid of all of those extra vitamin bottles and finally make some room in your cabinet. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one solution that actually tastes good. You'll actually enjoy getting your daily vitamins in. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and even aging. All of the things. It's also lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or you are gluten-free. Uh, it also contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting good. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season just around the corner. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. One scoop in a cup of water every day. No need for a million different pills and other supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do, 
go visit athleticgreens.com slash Johnston. It's CJ's last name, athleticgreens.com slash Johnston uh, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. Uh, unless we have any other Phil Kessel anecdotes we want to go through, I think it's time for Ask CJ. It's uh, the time where we get to some questions sent out by y'all uh, towards uh, Big Money CJ over here. Uh, are you ready to take in some questions, sir? I am. I am. Mr. Mike MTL, what are your thoughts on the goalie situation in the league? It seems like teams are or have switched to a two-goalie system with a third being important. See Pens and Carolina last year. Is it wise to invest heavy money into one goalie or spread it over three? I think it's wise to invest in one goalie if his name is Andre Vasilevsky, Igor Shosturkin, you know, maybe Jake Ottinger. We'll see. Like, I think he has the possibility of being kind of in that same class in Dallas. But, you know, there's only a handful of, of players that play enough and that play at a consistently high enough level every year to, to sort of warrant that. I think if we look at sort of the middle tier of NHL goaltenders, there's a lot of variance from year to year in performance. There, there just is. And so most teams have to deploy a platoon. And the other thing is, I looked this up last year, I believe it was five goalies played more than 60 games. You know, if you go back 10 years before that, it was 13. So we've seen an evolution in the workload that that is expected of your goaltender. And so if, if you're getting below 60 games, you're getting close to a 50-30 split or maybe something more like, you know, 47-45 or what have you. Uh, oh, that's bad math. 47-35. Anyway, <laughs> it's uh, it, it, you need to you need to at least in most cases, Vasilevsky, Shesterkin are the outliers. Uh, you know, Hellebuck plays a lot in Winnipeg. I think Ottinger can be that guy in Dallas. But but you know, in general, you're going to need two or maybe three. And and we've seen teams win the Stanley Cup with that. I mean, there was an injury situation with Darcy Kemper last year in the playoffs. But Pavel Francouz has played very well in the games he had to play. The Avalanche won their cup with with two goalies almost sharing the load. Uh, again, that was somewhat situational, but that was good enough for them to win. And I think that there's a lot of other pretty top teams that are planning on trying to, to mimic that. The next question from uh, Dr. Sun. Uh, sorry if I'm not saying the name right. The yes, Sun is spelled S-O-N-N-E. Uh, CJ, I have a question for you. And if you answered it before, I'm sorry for not listening well enough. What is the minimum distance or time to make a run count for your daily run goal? So I haven't really set one. I, I will say I'm at 900 and something days now. There's only been like two days that were less than 5K. Um, both actually one was after my half marathon that I ran last weekend. I just was really, really sore last Monday. So I did like a 3K run. Um, and then I, I ran a marathon during the streak in uh, April 2021. And I don't remember what I ran the next day, but it was similar. It was like two or 3K. So I would say generally 5K is the minimum for me, but um, you know, in certain circumstances where I don't want to get injured, uh, I don't need to be a hero. So I only ran a couple K last week after the half marathon, but I'm already feeling well enough again and probably going to do 10 today. Um, wait a minute. When are you, when, how close are you to day 1000? I think it's January 23rd. Right. So it's pretty like I have only passed 900 in the middle of the month. So I, I can never remember what day it is, but I'm at about 910 days now. But a thousand is a right. big goal. I will say a thousand is a big goal for me at this point. Like to get this close, it's gonna take it's gonna take something serious for me to miss a day between now and January. Now, once I get to a thousand, I don't know. I don't know. I'll probably start thinking about two thousand. I who knows? Like I really like that this, this. You know, I've talked about this a lot in, in the show, but it it it's good. Provides good structure for my life. I enjoy it. My body's held up great. So you know, I'm gonna probably keep doing this as long as I can. CJ, I like that. You know, CJ Two K is a really good nickname for you. Oh my god. Do you know how long 2K is? Like, it's very long. A thousand it's really, days. It's a couple like, of years. I'm almost at three years to get to a thousand days. So it's hard to even imagine another three years. But, you know, time flies. Uh, it does. Uh, next one from Lacey Gracie 01. Uh, what is the most elite Christmas song? Also, what's next for Alex Chiasson? <laughs> I, did, I don't know if I, it kind of rhymes. It's, it's pretty hilarious. Elite Christmas song. I actually can picture it. It's it's the one I love the one where all the the rockers of the 80s got together. Oh, uh, uh, Do oh they God. know it's okay. Christmas time, time at all. At all. Is that all the UK elite. ones? What's that? 
aren't they all aren't i always thought um isn't that like i forget the name of that song but like aren't all the rockers from that particular one from the uk like is that like a maybe you don't know but like i always I thought don't know I, but I, I like that one i like a lot of i i have to say I, i'm a bit of a i like christmas <laughs> i i know it's sort of silly or whatever but i i'm i'll be itching to put up my tree like very soon here I'm going to have to like show restraint not to have that thing up by like November 5th or something. So um, the first song you're referencing, uh, do they know it's Christmas uh, recorded by band aid, which is a, which a charity supergroup featuring many British and Irish musicians. I'm not crazy. You know, uh, I nailed it. I tried to. Um, and I think they did a new one in like 2009 or something. They did, they did like a, a second version, but uh, oh, is, that, is that, I guess that could work as the, most elite christmas song i'm just saying uh, as of november yeah. 1st christmas music in my mind is fully like fine i know some people have like some people are like wait till december but yeah. i love this time of year i just do um i don't know big kid at heart that's true um what about this next one from uh, drew brewer a gingerbread man sits inside of a gingerbread house is he made of the house or is the house made of him he's made of the house very uh very quick what's your reasoning i don't know that that, that question <laughs> actually the question actually bends my brain like i'm worried if i start thinking about it like i'm gonna fall into a trance or something so i just want to give a quick answer and, and hope that i never have to think about it again very fair last one from trevlar uh for ask cj uh if he's wanting some halloween costume suggestions he'd make an awesome dude from the big lebowski you ever watch the big lebowski uh no oh i could mm, okay yeah you gotta add we that to your movie list in cj's movie corner i was actually game we didn't that. abandon it at all i feel like someone just is as into it as much as we no, thought i'm movie. actually into it i want to like i want <laughs> i want the people to tell me what movies they want me to watch and i'll give you an honest assessment of them okay i think Thursday. i'm gonna see adam wild later this week so maybe i'll ask him about that to see if uh if he really wants me to do it Okay, look up The Big Lebowski. Uh, you'll see, uh, I think it's Jeff Bridges who plays the lead character in that movie. Yeah, you might need to grow out your hair a little bit, but like you could do it. You just need some robes and some sunglasses, which you already have. Maybe you grow up the beard a little bit more and just be like 10 times more chill than you already are. And you got it. All right. I might need that. Who knows? I, I haven't made any plans for a costume and we're a week out, so that's true i haven't either actually funny enough uh i wore a turtleneck a couple weeks ago uh and a couple people were saying i should dress like the rock from uh that photo with him with the turtleneck and the fanny pack <laughs> i might have to resort to that but uh we'll see how that goes uh that's gonna do it for ask cj and uh, the monday edition of the chris johnston show we'll be back on thursday with stick taps and uh you know what you might as well if you're on discord or on twitter if you just like cj just start tweeting at him or just messaging him a bunch of recommendations for movies for him to watch. Maybe we'll start getting to those on Thursday. <laughs> we could do that as a Thursday thing, actually. CJ's uh, movie recommendations. All right. I mean, I got this is a good week. The Leafs are out of town, so I don't have any games to go to. So I'm just here doing my thing. All right, cool. For CJ, I'm Julian saying so long and peace. And yes, that is ridiculous. Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Canada's sports book. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.